Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to Fired Up. I am your host, Dimitri Theophanis, and we have an exciting program for you today from Australia. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to mention that, as you probably all know by now, it's the International Year of Glass, and there is a ton going around worldwide uh, in the celebration that the United Nations has designated uh, to celebrate this amazing material. So if you have a chance, I encourage you to visit the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass website. We have a list of exhibitions and other happenings going on that is being continually updated. So you can find out what's going on in your region or to places that you might be traveling to. Okay, and today we have with us artist Kate Baker from Australia. She has a background in photography, printmaking, and sculpture. So she's really pulling from a variety of different places when she creates her artwork. And it's a very innovative and different use um, that we probably haven't seen too much when it comes to glass. So I'm really excited to be able to share her work with you today. Um, and without further ado, let's go ahead and turn it over to Kate. Thank you. Kate is muted. You're still muted. It's on the bottom left hand side. It could be your computer settings, perhaps, if. Sorry, yeah, it's st you're still muted. I don't know. Sorry, I thought I'm so sorry. I had a jam with my um, computer. I don't know what happened. It just sort of. Anyway, I'm on my way. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so sorry. Um, I'll just share my screen again. Um, oh, and please uh, feel free to put any questions you want in the chat. And um, Kate most likely will take the questions towards the end. Um, so be prepared for that, please. Yeah, we will actually be holding the questions until the end, but you can go ahead and place them in the chat as they come to you and just know that we're not missing them. We will get to them um, at the end of the presentation. Hello, can everybody see my presentation on the screen? Yes, we can. Oh, fantastic. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining, um, for inviting me today, which is really lovely. Um, I've known about your group for a while and I've been sort of following you on the internet and having um, a look and learn about what you do, which has been really lovely. So when Demetra approached me, um, I was very honoured uh, to have the opportunity to uh, meet with you in Zoom and in virtual space and, um, and have an opportunity to share um, some information and, and um, background about my practice. So thank you very much for you are for inviting me. Um, today, my presentation, I've titled it Beyond the Material, and I'll go into some more detail as we go along um, why I've titled it that. But I thought I'd start uh, with a little bit of background. Yeah, no, it's not doing that. Okay, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, this is my studio here in Sydney in Australia. And I've been in Sydney for about the last 15 years. But prior to that, um, I studied at the Canberra School of Art um, under Stephen Proctor. And many of the Australian glass artists uh, studied there. There are some other places to study as well, but Canberra's a particularly um, exciting art school for glass. And um, was a really uh, wonderful opportunity that happened many moons ago for me now. And, um, but since graduating, I've really established 
uh, my practice in Sydney. Um, and then in 2017, I decided to return to the Canberra School of Art uh, by distance to do my PhD. And I'm in the final weeks actually of finishing that. There was a few lags with COVID, but um, I'm now actually just about to submit my thesis, which is really exciting. So that's been a really lovely opportunity as well, because um, Canberra's only about three and a half hours from Sydney. So it's not impossible to get to and from um, in a kind of uh, distance capacity. Yeah, so as I was saying, for about the last 10 to 12 years, my practice is centered around the integration of the digital image and studio glass, so kiln form glass, mostly. Uh, working with sheet glass, this is a piece, for a long time I worked in bullseye glass, fusing uh, bullseye glass together and screen printing high fire enamels into the layers of the glass and um, working the surfaces, sometimes uh, sandblasting and embossing the surfaces using resist and other uh, light sensitive resists. Um, so this is a diptych I made back in 2011 and it has several layers of imagery and um, and both uh, embossed onto the surface and layered into the glass. Um, so my processes, and I've got a little video a bit later in the talk about um, my processes in the studio, which are really sort of between working with the glass hot and cold, and also doing a lot of screen printing and digital image making. So photography, working quite extensively on the computer, to prepare the images uh, for exposure onto screens and then screen printing them onto the glass, firing them onto the glass. I mean, it's not unusual for uh, one work to go into the kiln maybe 10 or 12 times to build up the layers in the imageries. And often there'll be a number of different images, but even when there's just the one image, sometimes um, it involves layering that image up slowly by um, screen printing it, firing it on, screen printing the next layer on, firing that on, depending on the type of uh, quality of image that you want. Sometimes you need to build your image slowly over time. So it's one of those things where you're putting it in and out of the kiln quite regularly. And it's very nice to kind of fire your work on as you're going. So you might screen print your enamels onto your sheet glass, put it into the kiln and fire it on. And then that layer is on, you know, it's now fired on. So anything that you put on over the top, you can wash off and you can sort of build it up a bit like, um, yeah, you can just build it up over time, a little bit like a painting, you can work over the top um, and you can sort of bed down the layers that you're really happy with and then work on the next layer until you get it how you want it. And then once you've got it where you want it, you can fire it on and you keep building from there. Um, this is an image of work I made quite some time ago now, 2008, but this is where the starting point really was for me um, after graduation from art school. These were some really early works that I made. I was very preoccupied with surface treatments and getting some lovely carved surfaces onto the glass, um, forming the glass and layering the imagery inside and also cutting the imagery, sometimes deep, like in this situation, in this circumstance, uh, cutting um, the texture onto the glass. So images and textures being formed out of the glass surface treatments and different depths. So then I went on from that sort of phase to moving in around 2016, I really wanted to get more of a nuance in my imagery um, relating to the digital uh, photographic quality in the work. Um, and naturally screen printing and resist and these sorts of techniques that require you to uh, produce a bitmap um, to sort of simplify the image into dots basically um, for preparation to go onto either a screen or onto the light sensitive emulsion. Um, it can be very difficult to get that fine, fine photographic detail. So around 2016, I spent a lot of time researching uh, ways to uh, finesse that fine detail in both those processes. And I 
um, used to drive the, um, well, I went from Ray Zist to, um, there's another one. Um, I, I'm just trying to remember what it's called. There's another, it's a dry uh, light sensitive resist. If people are familiar with using uh, light sensitive resists like Ray Zist as a sandblasting uh, contact, uh, Ray Zist is a washout version and rapid mask is the dry version and you don't actually have to wash it out. So that's quite a nice, I found that that was quite a nice, um, quite a nice uh, product that you could really um, get some fine detail with. But of course, I was really, really pushing the pointy end with that. So I did drive myself and the reps a bit nuts for a while. But I, this is an example of an image just on a grey, it's just sandblasted onto a grey uh, panel of plate glass. So the whole image is formed purely out of the frosted and gloss glass and the variables in between. But to get to this sort of pointy end at that point of time, and I think perhaps the technology is always advancing, so you just have to keep abreast with what they're doing. And um, But at this time, this was about as fine a detail as I could get. And then I went into a stage at about... Um, 2016, 2017, and I started to look at uh, UV flatbed digital printing, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, where I, again, I was very preoccupied with trying to get that sort of photographic quality in the work. I was very frustrated with screen printing and the sort of lack of detail um, that I was able to achieve. And I discovered that the process of UV flatbed printing, which is a cold, process, um, they print it directly, basically UV flatbeds can print pretty much onto any substrate at all. Um, and the ink is kind of cooked onto the surface of the substrate. So they can print directly onto metals, glass, um, you know, people are printing onto concrete, all sorts of stuff. I mean, you can get as experimental and crazy as you like, but as long as um, it's completely flat, and not too thick, then it seems to be, go onto the printing bed. Okay, but of course, it's not a process that you can then put back into the kiln or anything like that. So that presented another issue for me because I wanted it to be a part of a whole suite of techniques. So then I had to sort of look at how I could then integrate it somehow with fused glass. And that's when I moved to these sorts of series, which is actually layering of fused and screen printed glass. Um, the panels are sort of hovering, and they're sort of floating in front of uh, UV flatbed digitally printed aluminium panels. So the digital print is on the aluminium and the glass are bullseye glass panels and they're screen printed the figure is screen printed inside the layers of those glass, those uh, glass panels, and the glass panels are then the surfaces are then worked. But the um, panels are then I developed a system using neodymium magnets to click the panels. So the magnets are um, uh, glued onto the back. They're very small and they're glued onto the back of the glass panels. And then there's some um, water jet cut or laser cut holes in the aluminium panel and the magnets just click in and out. Um, they adhere to uh, steel backing at the back um, of the panel, which was quite a neat little system, except of course you need a really fabulous glue. And the system's never failed me except glue. The glue has failed me. The magnets have never failed me, but the glue um, is a really tricky to find the right glue that will actually stand up to holding that it's been has been a was a real challenge um, but this is more of a detail of those works so this was sort of a way of reconciling wanting to get that fine digital quality in the work and this is sort of a period um, when I started to really fall in love with the integration of metal and working with digitally printing on metal and integrating that with glass because the aluminium had an absolutely beautiful uh, moody quality to it um, and it really 
activated the glass and the relationship between the metal and the glass was something that, yeah, I really enjoyed developing. I guess I haven't really talked yet much about the content of my work. I think I'm very interested. I'm always obviously very interested in the figure, very interested in the figure um, really for me as a metaphor um, for more of an internal psychological space. So the figure becomes a sort of physical manifestation of more of an unseen um, uh, realm of human experience, I guess. So it's sort of working with the figure as a way of talking about our non-physical selves um, through an abstraction of, of physical form. Uh, when I commenced my PhD, I uh, wanted to take the opportunity to really sort of deconstruct my existing practice because I've been increasingly, as you've seen in the previous slides, increasingly I've been fairly limited to flat panels and working with um, uh, sort of um, imagery inside of glass in a way that that the glass was increasingly becoming a substrate for an image-based practice. And I really wanted to explore how I could get more form into the glass, how I could get the glass sort of off the wall, if you like, and into more of a sculptural space and to be able to activate the glass with light and space and form and for the glass to behave more like an environment for the digital image rather than a substrate. Um, so in the first couple of years of my PhD research, I really got into developing a whole lot of uh, slumping, figurative slumping moulds with a view to creating forms that um, could then be suspended into installations in which uh, digital image could then reside within. And through a long process of R&D, I developed all of these uh, concrete, refractory concrete moulds um, out of body castings. So these became, I basically got a dura cast or shearer cast and I had to come up with, I didn't know at the time how to come up with a slumping mould that could take on, you know, a figurative form or a detailed form, a sculptural form um, that would actually have the refractory qualities to last over and over and over again. So I really needed, for this project, I really needed these moulds to be able to go in and out of the kiln maybe hundreds of times. So, of course, plaster silica and those sorts of materials won't withstand that. So I had to develop a, a way of getting the duracast to work. And I found that by sieving, sieving out the um, grog, because it's a very groggy substance and of course you lose half of it doing that. But um, I could get this really lovely fine um, concrete that, and these still work today. I've still got these molds in the studio and um, that looks a little bit like a morgue, but, <laughs> but, um, but they are very, very strong and they've lasted and lasted and lasted. And I don't throw them out because they're quite expensive to make, but they were really, um, and they're very, very useful for all sorts of things. Um, even if you're not using figurative form, a light slump over these can do all sorts of interesting things. Um, and this is them all having a bit of a sunbake after they've been, again, I was sort of really interested in sort of the frag fragmenting the figurative forms and, I wanted to sort of develop forms that sort of echoed some of the ideas that existed in my imagery about abstracting human form as a way to kind of um, create an evocative space between our physical and not so physical um, selves. And then, so the slumping moulds have been produced and then I wanted to get into slumping forms. And of course, again, I didn't want them to be just big square sheets. So I developed um, these shapes out of life drawings, just loosely formed the lines out of loosely formed life drawings to kind of get a bit of abstraction happening between 
the lines of these um, sheets and the forms that they then got slumped into. And initially I explored screen printing onto these. This was the first step. Um, so I was firing the screen printing on as I was slumping the shapes over the moulds um, to get these sort of abstracted sort of figurative. So they echoed the figure without being too literal. And that resulted in lots and lots and lots of forms. And then I had an exhibition at the National uh, Glass Museum here in Australia in Wagga Wagga. And I began with these very early incarnations um, of these sculptures, which um, I never even really liked at the time, but they were a really huge beginning um, of this new direction. But again, like all beginnings, um, they needed a lot more development. And this was them sort of suspended in the space. I mean, they were okay, but they had a few issues. And the imagery, I just felt that there was a lot more potential than I was able to realise with the screen printing and the glass. Um, I really wanted to introduce light into the dynamic. And I'll talk a little bit about how I did that in a minute. And so in this show, I had two, really two major series of works. I had the sculptures that had st I'd started developing for my PhD, and then I had these floating uh, panels, which were suspended outside um, or they inside the windows, but you could see them and they're translucent. And um, I was really taken by how um, powerful they were actually when you were walking inside the gallery during the day because the light they would just be so activated by the light and in turn would activate the whole space the kind of the they were very transcendent in the way the light would come through them through the day and really kind of they were very very moody and um and responsive to light which was sort of a really exciting discovery to sort of get the glass finally off the wall and stopped with that limitation but of course you know, I love them in this setting, but I didn't want to be making work that was all the time that was so site specific. I really wanted to be able to come up with works that were independent of a specific architectural setting so that they could travel and, and have a life outside of a, a specific building such as this. So that's when I sort of reimagined these panels. I started thinking, well, I want to get them off the wall. I want to activate them with light, I want the light to be able to travel through them and I want them to exist as an object within space and not be um, simply an image um, on glass. I really wanted them to be a glass object in which an image resided um, and that was quite a different way of thinking about making. Um, and that's when I designed these uh, bases uh, for these works. So I, I built these steel bases that um, were a little bit like, they functioned a little bit like shadows behind the work that suspended, counterbalanced the panels. And then they could um, stand as objects within the space, which um, was um, a really nice solution. And they, they're quite commanding in a group. Um, and I was really very pleased with them. There's actually a series of seven. Uh, one is with the Corning Museum of Glass. You might have noticed that it's currently travelling with the new glass now. So there's one at the Wagga Wagga Gallery here in Australia. And I think I've got two going. I've got two in South Korea and <laughs> two going to Shanghai. So they're all sort of splitting up now. But um, but yeah, they're a really lovely series and a nice way of resolving um, how to engage the material of glass in, in a different way to render images. I think you're always limited a little bit with glass. Something like glass, the image can very easily dominate the uh, direction of the technical processes. And I think for my PhD, it was really about pushing back and saying, well, how can we reimagine this relationship between image and glass in a way that gives the glass a voice and, and a say in, in how the image is experienced and not allow the image to completely dominate the relationship. Uh, 
this was um, following on from the Within Matter series I started. Um, so the Within Matter series were digitally printed onto glass, translucent glass, and you could see them in the round. So they were, um, you would look through them and the light would pass through them and you can see the image on both sides. But I also became very interested in printing onto Silver Mirror, which grew out of my uh, experiences printing on uh, aluminium and and I also was experimenting at this time, the same time on with uh, screen printing, I mean digital printing on um, mirror finished stainless steel. So this uh, series or piece of development, I was very interested in working with Silver Mirror because I was fascinated with the way in which it could absorb and refract light through the image. So that this is a mix, this, this work is a mix of um, screen printing, uh, cutting onto the surface sandblasting. So the textures at the top um, are all screen printed or etched onto the surface of the glass mirror before anything else happens. And then the last process is actually the digital print that goes over the top of everything. It actually always looks like the digital print is under everything, but it's not. It's actually the last process because everything else is obviously cutting and doing all sorts of stuff. And once the digital print goes down, then you have to be very careful with the surface of the finished product. Um, it's totally baked on, but it's not like you can um, rough it up in the, in the studio or anything like that. So uh, this was, again, looking at the way... Uh, light and glass could activate um, an image and the way that an image could behave as an object um, in space, sort of commanding space and light rather than um, existing as, as an image plane. I sort of started to entertain the idea of the image as like a fourth dimension within a three-dimensional object. So you have an object that's existing as an object and then you have an image that resides within that object. Um, and these, again, these went back to going onto the wall, but again, you've got this sort of um, relationship between light, reflection and absorbing and refracting. Um, and even in parts of these, you can even sometimes see yourself in some of these images because of the mirror quality. Most of it's got a digital print on it, but then there's times um, when you can actually see the space in the room inside the work and these are yeah very responsive to light and very responsive to space that they inhabit so I really enjoyed developing the work out of mirror it's a really interesting um there's a lot of interesting possibilities there so um these are actually images of my daughter um playing on the trampoline at dusk. And then I decided I'd screen print and layer all these notes. So basically this is, these are quite personal works about motherhood really. Um, looking at, so all of the digital notes and, and drawings are all being accumulated um, over the years of when I had the children and when I had the children and they were very young. Um, and I guess it's a bit of a metaphor about that sort of um, dichotomy of motherhood, of wanting to have your own direction and wanting to have continue your own life, but then feeling completely consumed by the love and devotion you feel for your children. And then also, but also want, not wanting to entirely relinquish your uh, vision in your art practice. And so that sort of... Um, that idea of those two things competing, I guess, was um, where this work was coming from. And that's just another um, piece. As this is at the Canberra Glassworks, actually. This was an exhibition I had um, in the Canberra Glassworks in 2019. And these works um, formed a series. And this is in the engine room, the magnificent, beautiful engine room, if you ever have the opportunity to visit. Um, Canberra glass, Glassworks. It's just an absolutely incredible place. But don't forget to visit me too in Sydney. <laughs> uh, so this is a little three-minute video 
if we have uh, time to just show you some of my processes and in the studio. So I'll just pop that on now. My studio practice is really about the interdisciplinary relationship between the digital and photographic image and studio glass. Screen printing and working with light sensitive emulsions have been an intrinsic part of my process in the development of my work. I start by creating highly detailed photographic bitmaps on film positives that are derived from my photographic work in the field. Exposing images onto the screen or sometimes several screens using a UV light process allows me to build my own visual language. I can take a photo or a series of photos and reinterpret and reimagine them through this process. Translating images in this way gives me a creative scope to build a work through the layering of several different images, often on several screens. I then print these images directly onto the glass, often building an image through many layers. This can sometimes be on one sheet of glass, but often it's on many layers that eventually come together to form the one work. The process of screening imagery onto the glass can be applied to both hot and cold studio glass applications, making it a highly versatile process. In recent years, I've also been working with industry partners to integrate the UV flatbed digital printing process into my work, in particular printing onto glass and mirror. UV flatbed printers are essentially large scale digital printers designed to print directly onto glass or pretty much any substrate with the UV light bonding the ink onto the surface of the material. Another process I work closely with in the creation of my work is the use of light sensitive sandblasting resists to create imagery on the surface of the glass through sandblasting. The resists work in a very similar way to the way in which emulsion does on the screens in that the image is created through exposing the material to UV light through a film positive. The image is then cooked into the resists, which work a little like a sticky contact, which is then applied onto the glass. And when the work is then sandblasted in the cabinet, the resist which has been exposed comes away, allowing the image to be formed through the blasting process. Different resists can be used in different ways to create either deeply embossed texture right through to highly detailed photographic work created through a light dusting on the surface of the glass. So essentially I can build an image on the surface of the glass as a texture. In the end, the challenge of my practice is really in how to integrate all of these processes with each other in ever more nuanced and sophisticated ways. As the technology in industry continues to evolve into the future, I hope this will also further inform and enhance my practice going forward. Oops. My studio practice is really... Sorry. Um, yeah, so that just gives you a little uh, view into my studio practice. But then I'll just... Um, going back to the forms that we were talking about before. After Wagga, I decided the screen printing on these forms was really not working. And I was quite frustrated uh, by that. So, and I really had the idea that I wanted to link the image um, to light rather than adhere it onto the surface of the glass. And that's when I started thinking about projecting a uh, moving image through the glass forms as a way of integrating the image into the surface of the glass. So I came back from Wagga, I took all the imagery off these glass forms and repolished and worked all the surfaces and then started thinking about rather than photographic image, actually moving image and actually recording um, the same ideas but over a protracted period of time. And I was lucky enough that one of my students uh, was a professional actor here in Australia, and she very kindly uh, offered to perform in one of my first works. Uh, 
And at the same time, I was invited to have a solo exhibition with the Canberra School of Art. And so I, um, I developed the video work and in the Smokestack Gallery it seemed like the perfect space to then hang um, a new incarnation of these um, and to develop a video work where I had a figurative form existing inside the work and I was working with the figurative extraction in the same way as I was in the photographic imagery, but I was exploring it as a moving image work with the integration of gesture and movement and physical expression, and then also looking at sound um, as well, and sort of exploring a sort of psychological space through the performance inside the glass. And this is us hanging it up. And this was the first time I'd ever hung this work up and it took about oh, two weeks. I don't know, it took a long time. It was an enormous amount of work. Now it's all mapped and it goes up in about, um, yeah, I can get it up in about 45 minutes. But um, Kate, I'm not sure we're seeing the slide you want us to see. What, what one do you see? We're seeing the beginning of your process video. Oh my goodness, really? Oh, my screen sharing's being paused, I see. Mm. Why was that? Hang on, stop share and I'll go share screen again. Sorry about that, can you see it now? Yes. Oh, Thank sorry. You. So we went back, sorry, I was talking, so you probably didn't see any of these, did you? We did not. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, talking about uh, my friend Liana, who um, who is a professional actor. She's quite a well-known actor here in Australia, and um, she very kindly performed for me. And it was my first um, experience working with a professional actor because up until that point, I'd always uh, photographed uh, people, uh, amateur people, like pretty much anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was weird. My children, people are captive, <laughs> captive. Uh, people in my family and friends so um and that's very easy to do because it's still it's easy to orchestrate a still um with somebody who it, because they don't have to sustain that emotional tension you, you can kind of build it in the framework of the image whereas the moving image you is, is quite, I realized very quickly it was quite a different process you really need the um the the subject to be very much engaged in the expression of the ideas and so this was the first time I'd ever worked with a professional actor and she was absolutely amazing I was quite terrified how it's going to work because I was like well I don't know what to, how to direct you but she was just fantastic and I can't they ask it's, it's just quite so amazing because I was very interested in um, really capturing a whole lot of like a range of human emotions like the work that was called is called Pulse and it's really about sort of the spectrum of human emotion, the spectrum of the psychological range of um, human experience. And, and, and she was able to really capture that whilst also still having conversation with me <laughs> at the same time going, is it reading? Da, 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 da. And the next thing she's in this sort of state. So it was really um, quite a privilege to, and now I've sort of grown into this work, I'm doing a lot of work in that area. But yeah, so like I was saying, I took the images, the screen printed images and started looking at how I might project moving image into the work. And this is when I went to the Canberra Glassworks to the Smokestack Gallery and um, we started hanging up the works and I was very lucky to have the team there at the Canberra Glassworks to help me and, and wonderful John there up on the ladder who's the most patient man in the planet and I'm not sure it would have happened without his patience because it was unbelievable because this was the first time we'd ever hung this and as you can see by all the strings and all the forms the shadows it was epic absolutely epic and now I mean we learned so much through this process and now other installations are so much easier to make as a result but this was a massive learning curve um, and was a huge team effort and anyway we produced Pulse which is a 10 minute uh, looping video sound installation that exists inside this uh, two meter ball of glass forms. And obviously it's best watched in the dark. And 
it was a really lovely way of again activating the glass and the glass activating our experience of the image. So I'd really achieved what I'd set out to achieve at the beginning of my PhD, which was really to bring the materiality of glass to the image making process, to actually to stop thinking of the glass as a passive substrate for an image and actually start thinking about the glass as a material in which we can render images. Um, and that was a really big breakthrough uh, for me. And one of the great privileges of being able to do the research with the PhD was actually to have that space to really sort of deconstruct my existing practice and reimagine what I wanted to do with glass. And it really did take sort of five years, <laughs> but, but it was a way of really bringing bringing out an understanding of the material of glass to, to, to an image making practice. And that was a really exciting uh, breakthrough. And this is just a little video. It's not a fabulously done video. I'm in the process of doing a much better one, but um, I'll just give you a little indication. We'll just watch it for a couple of minutes or a minute or two and just, you can see, um, Anyway, yeah, as I said, the full range of emotions, she gets a bit intense. <laughs> but, yeah, there's basically a 10-minute sort of moving up and down of different emotions. But it's um, the lines that are in that video is um, not in the work, but it's part of the problem of um, filming. The, the projector was not a laser projector, and so when you film it, you can get some streaking. But, um, yeah, I've since come a long way with my understanding of uh, projection. <laughs> And this is another little um, video. I'm not sure how we're going for time, Demetra. How are we? We're doing fine, Kate. Okay, so we can yeah. watch this. This is a little bit of a, like another little documentary on Pulse, which might help you see a little bit more of the actual work. challenging um, pieces of work that I've ever worked on. I think because I've faced the ultimate challenge, I guess, as an artist of actually really wanting to pair the work back to a completely honest and um, unself-conscious work that really, I guess for myself personally, explored my own stories with death and with my mother dying when I was very young and then having a number of other deaths happen throughout my life.
or I don't want the glass to be a screen, if you like, or a substrate for a video. I really want the relationship between the moving image and the studio glass to interrelate and talk about material, matter, light and space in a very kind of delicate and considered way. I look at our physicality as not only temporal but also uh, very precious and people often talk about spirituality as being something separate from our physical um, material experience and yet for me I feel much of my work is very much questioning what it is to have a physicality, what it is to live in a material existence with matter, with a body, with a body where you can think and feel and have experiences and once you don't have that anymore then we all wonder what you do have but but we, while we do have that, we certainly have that space and that is the space that I think the complexity of that space and the, the incredible range that we experience as, as human beings whilst we are alive, I think is really the core of my work. There we are. <laughs> it's a bit intense, but <laughs> whoops. Where to now? So um, coming out of uh, the development of Poles, uh, Lin Zhang, who's the director of the Shanghai Museum of Glass, um, approached me. He'd seen Poles and he approached me and asked if I would like to do a solo exhibition at the Shanghai. Museum of Glass, which was a very exciting and wonderful um, invitation. And uh, due to COVID, that has been um, delayed um, a couple of times now. Um, but as it keeps getting delayed, it just keeps getting bigger <laughs> and bigger and bigger. And it is now um, in the contemporary art, we're looking at doing a full solo show at their contemporary art wing, which is 500 square metres over two storeys. Um, and we'll, I'm, do, I'm currently developing five immersive video sound and glass installations. Um, so it's quite epic. Um, we've got, um, we're in the development of doing a number of works um, and I'm doing I've been doing quite a lot of uh, videoing. Um, I kind of want to keep it a little bit of a secret, but I can show you some, some of the um, images. I'm just looking here. This is the end of this slideshow, but I can, in the conversation, um, I thought maybe we could start the conversation and I could show up some couple of um, studio shots of what we're doing um, in the studio and I can show you a bit of a video, but I thought maybe... Um, so you'd yeah. like to start the Q&A now, Kate? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. All right. But I'd also, sorry, sorry, Dimitra. I just wanted to say also that um, you're very welcome to get in touch with me at any time if you'd like to learn more about the work. And if you're coming to Australia, please do um, come and say hello in Sydney. I'd really love anyone to come visit me in the studio. It's quite, it can be quite, um, it's busy, but it can be quite kind of, um, a bit lonely too so I always like a bit of company so you're very welcome to come and have a cup of tea and um, say hello if you're in town definitely so there thanks to me <laughs> yeah no, it was uh, really an incredible presentation and um, particularly the last video of Pulse was quite mesmerizing and you know I want to say that your use of techniques is not only really innovative but I think what was so striking to me in the moment is that as I was watching that video um, and I'm sure for others as well, you really forget that you are seeing glass because you forget about the material and you're really just experiencing the emotion of the moment, which was quite 
quite transcendent. So thank you for that. Um, we do have a couple of questions about the video. Um, someone is wondering where the light source of pulse is placed. Well, in that particular, well, this is the, the ongoing thing. Um, so the projection, the light source is the projector and the projector in that particular work, we put it behind, but that was because we didn't really know what we were doing. I think really it's best coming now I'm getting, I'm actually in a, I've actually got funding to do a partnership with the projection mapping company and they're helping me enormously. They're an amazing team here in Australia that are coming to the studio and they're working with me on the new installations and they know everything about projection and it's a whole nother world. Like you could have a whole nother career just in projection. So the more I get into this interdisciplinary thing, the more I, I'm sort of playing the role of the producer and actually just getting the professionals to help me with it because it's just too big for one person um, to be across it all. And they, so the direction, there's a huge thing, but basically you're wanting it to come from the top so that you don't get that ball of light that mm -hmm. I have had problems with because it's coming front on. You want your light to be coming, projecting down, and then you want to, then there's a whole art of mapping it to the actual shape of the sculpture. So, you know, obviously every projection is sort of square. So you want, so what my friend um, Sue Ann did with Pulse was we projected it inside a bigger square and then we blacked out all the outside and we actually shaped the, we mapped the sculpture, we mapped the image to the shape of the sculpture. And it, it's amazing how it kind of wraps around your sculpture too. Like the light is quite interesting how it behaves. It, it does sort of curve around corners and it's quite fun like that. It's not as rigid as I imagined it would be, but yeah. And is Pulse going to be traveling to the US? Well, I'd love it to. <laughs> um, it's going to Shanghai as a part of Shanghai. And I was actually really hoping that the Shanghai show could eventually travel to the US. So it's opening in Shanghai in 2024 um, for six months until October. And I'm hoping, like I've started the conversation with Lynn and about how we might be able to then tour it after that because it's just going to be a massive massive body of tour ready work just sitting there so it seems um obvious to try and um see what other museums in the world might be interested in hosting it um so if you know of any museums in the us that might want to take it on or even parts of it because it's going to be huge um yeah. so not every museum would be suited to having it but they might be suited to having one or two works or one series for example so pulse is the first mm -hmm. and um but there's lots of there's lots of others coming um which is uh, yeah so i can show you that a little bit when we keep chatting but yeah yeah i'd love it to go to the us it's um it's pretty cool and and it was such an epic they're so epic to produce like they're just massive 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 amount of work because there's so many variables every time you put one piece up it changes the whole thing you know like it, the shadow the castings it's epic it's such a huge thing and then when you get it um but now it's really tidy like it's all mapped and you can just put it up you know and bang it's up um and if i ever lost that map <laughs> I do get haunted. I do get haunted sometimes. I think, oh, where is it? Because <laughs> um, it's nothing without that map. Um, yeah, so it's an epic thing to do at the beginning. And then once you've got it, it's um, it's done. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's really interesting to see also the progression from that first um, 3D sculptural installation that you showed us that you said you weren't quite happy with. And it it was sort of a a nice start to that new investigation and to see how things have progressed and and to where it's at has been just really fascinating so thank you for sharing that 
journey with us. Um, so there's an artist that wanted to know what type of glue you use to uh, resolve some of the issues you had in hanging your work. Oh, I was using Hextel, um, but it wasn't cutting it in that circumstance. Um, I've tried lots of different Loctites. I've actually um, haven't resolved my glue issues. Um, I've been sort of, I'm just in ongoing negotiations with reps and I think I'll get there in the end. But yeah. when I when I do nail it, I'll, I'll let you know because I don't want anyone else to have to suffer. Right. <laughs> it's very, yeah, it's sort of funny when you're doing this sort of stuff, you know, it's such a, you know, things that probably someone told you would take two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> because nobody knows you've got to spend two years working in it. But, but yeah, no, I'm sorry. I don't have a solution for the glue. Those do hold up for a while and then they don't. So um, I think the glue, the trick with the glue I always find is there's got to be a degree of flexibility in it. There has to be a degree of uh, flex, but also strength. And when you're wanting the glue to, to hold in such a small area, look, I find Sikaflex really fantastic. Uh, Sikaflex 11 FC on the back of mirrors, on the back of metal when, you, when you're not got a translucent back. Mm -hmm. um, I find that really fantastic. But when you want a very clear glue that's right. also flexible um, and holds up the sky, I don't know, I haven't got there yet. Yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the parts of the process that I think a lot of people don't see when they're viewing something in an exhibition or in a gallery there's so much research and investigation that just goes into the tiniest little things um, that really add time to the process. Um, someone else is asking, uh, if someone is interested in your work, where and how would they go about purchasing? Um, probably contacting me directly at the moment. Um, I, sell, I do sell directly out of my studio. I have um, a gallery in South Korea and I have a gallery in Melbourne, services in Victoria, but um, I'm quite happy to um, sell directly as well. And I do do commissions as well. So sometimes people uh, want work that's more specific to their needs and that's totally fine as well. You work with a lot of different layering in your pieces and um... I was trying to understand in terms of the aluminum and the glass, it seems like you're printing on both. Is that correct? And then allowing yourself to get a more complex layering as you place one on top of the other. Was that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. So I've developed ways to screen print um, enamel onto metal and glass and the digital as well and then I'm doing less and less kiln forming and more and more cold processes that seems to be where I'm going the kiln forming now seem, is more uh, for the installation work I've kind of stopped digitally printing and screen printing I might go back to it but at the moment um, I think because I just want that photographic quality and screen printing can get it to a point and then after that you can't get it um, you can get it with decals, but it's very small and it, it, there's a lot of problems. And and I because I tend to work, I don't always work big, but I tend to work at a re reasonably large scale. Decals were never really. Um, yeah. Large. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think I'm going to stop the recording and just open it up so that if people want to unmute themselves and talk to you directly, they can do that. Um, but thank you again, Kate, for really just an inspiring and, and such an informative presentation. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Demetra. Thank you very much for having me. It's quite an honor. And I'd, yeah, I'd love to meet you all sometime. I love coming to the States. That's fun. And hopefully we'll be able to get about, out and about again soon. <laughs> yes.